My name is Scott Cheater, and today I'll be talking about demand response through advanced lighting controls. A little more specifically, I'm going to start today's presentation with an introduction to demand response, followed by some more detail about how commercial buildings use electricity and electric demand, then ways of reducing lighting power, followed by types of lighting demand response. Conclude with a little bit of how-to and some concluding remarks as well. First, the introduction. So here's what we're trying to prevent, reading by candlelight. Today, we're talking about blackouts or brownouts caused by too much load being placed on the grid. To prevent this, utilities can build more capacity, such as the power plants and the infrastructure to support them. But that's an expensive proposition. Alternately, they can motivate consumers to reduce their demand during periods of high load, which is much less expensive per kW. One way to do this is demand response, which a very simple definition is reducing electric demand when electricity is really expensive because the grid is stressed. So what are some types of demand response? Uh, the first is economic. It's when building owners and operators recognize that they can save money by reducing power during times when the cost of power is high. Utilities encourage customers to reduce demand during peak periods by charging more for electricity during those times. Peak periods are typically late, af late morning and early afternoon on summer days, but can be morning and evenings on cold days in colder climates with significant electric heating. I found the local utilities time of use rate structure for small commercial buildings. Their peak period runs between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. And during summer months, the cost per KWH more than doubles from 6.5 cents to 16 cents. That big increase will definitely encourage people to find creative ways of shifting their energy consumption to off-period peak, off peak periods if possible. Uh, a second type of demand response is emergency. It often coincides with the same period as economic example, such as when it's very hot out. However, it can also be induced by climactic events such as wind or um, snow and ice. Building owners and operators agree to reduce their power consumption upon utility requests when grid is stressed. Uh, recently, smart grid technology has developed to allow utilities to send these signals to customers, often as little as a few hours ahead of time to reduce their demand for a certain period. Building owners and operators can then choose to reduce their demand in a variety of ways. As an HVAC engineer, I typically think of this as letting temperature set points drift during this period so that the cooling equipment doesn't have to work as hard. But to understand other ways in which demand can be reduced, we need to understand the ways in which buildings use electricity. And that's what we'll be talking about next. Commercial buildings represent nearly half of the U.S.'s peak electrical demand, but what is that demand comprised of? Uh, to answer, help answer that question, I developed a pretty simple energy model using eQuest of a typical office building in St. Louis. It's 50,000 square feet, built to the IECC 2009 code, and uses packaged variable air volume systems. Uh, I wanted to illustrate how its electric demand varies over a typical day and by end use. On the left, we see a plot of the electric demand by end use on the peak day, which in this example is August 28th. It's very hot out and the sun's out as well. The plug loads and lighting demand pick up when the people arrive in the building in the morning. Then the HVAC end uses ramp up as the day gets hotter and decline in the evening as it gets colder and the sun sets. On the right, we can see that at the peak hour of 2 p.m., which falls within our utilities peak period. Nearly two thirds is of this demand is from HVAC, namely the cooling and fans. However, one fifth of the peak demand is from lighting. This breakdown would vary significantly by climate and building type, but it makes the point that the peak period usually coincides with when the lights are on and that lighting is a sizable component of the peak demand. By the way, a nice side effect of reducing lighting power is that cooling load is reduced as well usually between 10 and 20 percent increase in the total reduction. Now a little bit more of how to actually reduce that lighting power component. 
So now the main question is whether there's anything we can do to reduce lighting power. And the answer is yes. We could turn out all the lights. Unfortunately, we need those lights to do our jobs. So lighting power and the available light or illuminance are essentially linear related, which means that we first have to understand more about how our eyes work and how much light we actually need. It turns out our eyes are pretty amazing. They can quickly and dynamically adjust to be able to clearly see in a wide range of environments, from sunny days at 10,000 foot candles, to cloudy days at about 1,000, to moonlit nights that have less than a foot candle, we can, we can see. And that's an order of magnitude adjustment of over 10,000 times. But how much light do we actually need? For com commercial buildings, the Illuminating Engineering Sci Society of North America publishes recommended amounts of light. It turns out they're called illuminants and foot candles. And this is often by space type, but more directly it's by visual task. As you'd expect, the more visually intense the task, the higher recommended light level. So classrooms where you need to read and write would require 40 foot candles, and bars um, where you don't need to do anything particularly visually intense require only seven and a half foot candles. So now we need to understand if there's ever more light in a given space than is actually needed. It turns out the answer to that is usually yes. There are a variety of reasons why there might be too much light in a space. In fact, a recent study I conducted found that commercial spaces were on average overlit by up to 20%. In many buildings, there wasn't much thought put into the lighting design. Uh, the reason that that could be is because in many buildings, there's not much thought put in the lighting design as a contractor simply, simply puts the same fixture on a uniform grid, project to project, without analyzing how much light is actually provided. When a lighting designer is involved on a project, there's a much greater chance that the lighting illuminance will be much more appropriate and in line with recommended levels. However, for many, many reasons, lighting designers can be forced to provide more light than, than is needed. One example is illustrated on the left, where we see an image of a room that has too many fixtures. Optimally, this training room would have four rows of fixtures. However, the room divider causes an extra row of fixtures to be added, increasing the amount of light by 25%. It is important to note that the conservative approach is to always provide more light than necessary to avoid callbacks or complaints. Another reason why there might be more light than is needed is not because of the design, but simply because of the availability of natural light. Many commercial spaces are located on the perimeter of buildings near windows. And during occupied periods, daylight is available, meaning that the amount of total light is way more than is needed if the electric lights are on as well. More importantly, peak demand typically coincides with periods during which the sun is out, making this even more likely. Lab and field studies have shown that significant reductions can be made to light levels and the corresponding electric power demand. If daylight is not present, light levels can be reduced by 15 to 20 percent from recommended levels without occupants even noticing, and between 20 and 30 percent was considered tolerable by the occupants. If daylight is present, the reduction can be even greater, up to 40 to 60 percent without occupants even noticing, and up to 80 percent was tolerable. Note that these are with respect to the recommended light levels. So if the light levels are actually higher than those, even more dimming is possible. This table also assumes that the dimming occurs continuously over some short period of time, for example, one minute. If the dimming, dimming happens instantaneously or stepped, then the reduction is much more noticeable. That's not recommended. Also note that if the dimming took place over a long period of time, up to 30 minutes, like in a demand response scenario, the further, then further reductions were obtainable. So now let's talk about two types of lighting demand response, passive and active. The first type, passive, involves lighting upgrades to save energy and electric demand. But the goal is to actually reduce utility bill costs. The demand response aspect is a beneficial byproduct. One approach to reducing lighting power demand is to simply use more efficient lighting. 
Incandescent lighting is a 100 plus year old technology that's currently being phased out. Fluorescent lighting is used in a majority of commercial spaces today and achieves substantial savings compared to incandescent. However, LEDs are the next revolution in lighting technology and are capable of energy and demand reductions of approximately 50% compared to fluorescent. Another approach to saving lighting power is to use lighting controls. Occupant sensors turn off lights when no one is present, which is great for energy savings but not reliable for peak demand savings. Daylight sensors automatically dim lights when sufficient daylight is present, which typically coincides with peak demand. And task tuning is a way of measuring the available light, determining if it's higher than recommended levels, and then reducing the high-end trim accordingly, which means that when an occupant turns on the lights, the lights are now essentially in line with the IES recommendations, as opposed to the higher installed lighting levels. Here we can see how these layered approaches can reduce demand during peak periods. Revisiting our St. Louis office example, the baseline reflects an average lighting power density of one watt per square foot. Upgrading to a more efficient lighting, which is a mix of better designed fluorescents and uh, some LEDs, reduces the lighting power by 25%. And then employing task tuning on top of that has been shown to save an additional 20%. Occupant sensors can be used to turn off lights when occupants aren't present, but that causes a fluctuating lighting power during the day. And it's a sunny day during the peak, so lots of available daylight, which means that our daylighting controls reduce lighting power more during the middle of the day when more daylight is present and less towards the end as the sun sets. In aggregate, we see a significant demand savings of 50% of the lighting power and since it's 20% of the total power, that's a 10% overall lighting or power reduction. Notice that this is during the utility's peak period. Um, however, these savings aren't reliable and they're not guaranteed. They just happen. Before we get to talking about a more reliable way of demand response, let's review some of the market penetration of the technologies we just discussed. In orange, we see the market penetration of occupancy sensors, which are by far the ha have by far the most market penetration at 16%. Task tuning, which doesn't really happen that much, and it, but is gaining a little bit of ground. And daylighting at 2%. So not that much lighting marking pa market power penetration of the three control technologies. In yellow, we see the technologies needed to enable demand response. Uh, continuous dimming is at 7%. And as opposed to HVAC, lighting rarely has a central control system, although this is becoming more common as well. Finally, in, in green, we see active demand response at 4% market penetration. So still pretty low. So what is active demand response? It involves purposely reducing electric demand during peak periods or in response to utility requests. It can be very low tech in which facility staff knows the peak period is coming and walks around the building dimming or turning off the lights. A more high-tech and reliable solution is to automate this process. It requires the ability to measure demand instantaneously, accept the signal to start and stop load shedding, lighting controls tied to a central location, and dimmable lighting, all of which are usually you get if you're pursuing a high-end lighting system capable of the controls discussed previously. The steps involved in active demand response are a demand response signal is sent from the utility or an energy aggregator. A smart meter relays that signal to a central lighting controller. The lighting control system sends a pre-programmed adjustments to the dimming unit, which then tells the lights to dim and load to be shed. It's, fairly, it's much easier and less expensive in new construction or retrofit projects in which lighting controls are already being implemented and can simply be an add-on. In, in existing projects, it's much more difficult and expensive, but not impossible, um, using load shedding ballasts. So now to talk a little bit about how to institute a, 
demand response program in your building. Here are the steps to instituting demand response. First, evaluate the spaces. For each space, evaluate whether or not demand response is possible. It is unlikely that it is applicable in retail, restaurants, or healthcare, or anywhere where safety is a concern. However, offices, warehouses, and education facilities are great candidates. Next, determine the amount of dimming possible. You can simply use the recommendations described previously, which were based on rigorous research. However, to be more accurate, you can measure the light levels in each space and compare to IESNA recommendations. Remember that the recommendations are conservative and meant for long-term long occupancy, so reducing below them for short periods of time is potentially possible. Then install and program your demand response lighting system. Many systems have simple settings for the reduction by lighting zone when in demand response mode. Commissioning complex systems is always a good idea to help ensure they're properly functioning. And following up with a measurement and verification is a great way to check that the system actually worked during a man demand response event. Many systems now have the ability to archive and display data, which is the critical component needed for MNV. A few things to keep in mind when measuring light levels. Detectors should be horizontal most of the time. In some cases, the recommendations are based on vertical illuminance, like on bookshelves, but that's more, much more rare than horizontal. Always use a factory calibrated light meter and wait for the lights to warm up, which can typically take up to five minutes from a cold start. Close the blinds and shades if possible to minimize any daylight and minimize your effect on the readings, as a light meter will read very differently if held at your chest as compared to arm's length. So either set the light meter on a surface and back away or hold it as far away from yourself as possible. After the lights have warmed up, take a light level reading at several locations throughout the space. If daylight is present, take a set of readings with the lights off and subtract the two. The IAS Lighting Handbook has procedures to take measurements at key locations and then formulas for averaging those, re those readings. You need to average because the recommended levels are averages and not spot measurements. Alternately, because this procedure can take some time, you can take one reading at the critical work plane. This is the location where someone will perform a visual task that receives the least amount of light. Or put another way, it's where the person is most likely to have to strain to see if the light levels are too low. It's typically a desktop away from fixtures and windows. And basing your reduction on this location ensures that sufficient light is provided to the person who would need it most. And finally, here's a screenshot of our building's energy dashboard. It's capable of displaying end-use power consumption on an hourly basis, which is great for measurement and verification. Another way to view this is, you know, on May 10th, if a demand response event occurred from 11 to 2 p.m., you'd want to see a reduction in light levels during that period. To conclude, lighting is an important part of any demand response program for commercial buildings. It can lead to significant peak demand reduction and currently, it's expensive with low market penetration. However, costs are decreasing and the need for demand response continues to increase. I've added a couple pieces of literature for further reading if you're interested. And if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with me at my email listed below. Thanks for your time. I hope you learned something.